I know you've wanted to write a book because we all want to write a book and it's damn hard. Today on CXO Talk, we're talking with the guy who is, he's the guy about how to write a book. I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst. I'm the host of CXO Talk. I'm so thrilled to welcome Josh Burnoff. He was the top analyst at Forrester Research. He's a best-selling author. And Josh Burnoff, welcome back to CXO Talk. I'm, I'm happy to see you. Thanks, Michael. I'm really great to be here to talk to your audience. Um, yes, in the last four years, I've focused my effort on writing and especially on helping authors who want to create a business book that helps them boost their standing as an expert. Tell us the name of your company. Okay, so uh, the name of my company is Wobs LLC, and that stands for Without Bullshit. Book I, that I wrote right after uh, leaving Forrester was called Writing Without Bullshit. So uh, I do tend to tell the truth, and that's something people have to get used to. It's funny because I always think of you as Mister No Bullshit, and you write a daily column. I mean, it's great. Yes, well, that's. That's what I want people to think of of me as. And I've increasingly focused that on telling the no bullshit story about what it takes to do a book and then uh, when you shouldn't do it, when it doesn't actually make sense for people. All right. So let's begin at the beginning. Why should somebody write a book? They need to ask a question, which is when this is done and it's out there, what's it going to do for me? Um, unless you really have a lot of idle time and this is just a hobby, the reason people write books is because they want to boost their standing as some sort of a thought leader or an expert. Um, so uh, the reason you write a book is because you have an original idea about something, about how people can be more productive, about how artificial intelligence is going to change the world, whatever it happens to be. And you want to help people to understand that and then eventually work with you or your company to actually uh, react to and benefit from that trend that you're talking about. Josh, explain the mechanism that these kinds of benefits uh, uh, happen when you, when you write a book. Well, uh, a book basically is content marketing. It's a way to get a, a, clot, a bunch of, of connected ideas out in the world where people can see them. So... Uh, it will certainly get people the ability to speak. Sometimes keynote speeches that make money, but in many cases, it's it's speeches uh, at other places in conferences. It will get you on to podcasts. It will get you other people writing about you, the ability to write op-eds. And I think to the extent that your book has an idea that spreads, it's a way for people to talk about what you think and tell other people about it. Um, and uh, create at least some sort of virality about your exciting way of looking at the world. So creating virality about your views and your name is a key thing. But I think many people look at bestsellers and they say, I can do that, and they want to get rich. It's very unlikely that somebody writing a business book is going to be successful to the point where they're making $500,000 a year on speaking engagements and bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of royalties. Now that happens. You know, there's a Daniel Pink out there. There are people like that, but most people just don't have the ability to rise to that level. And even if they do, they're unlikely to, to, to hit. I mean, it's a, it's a hit or miss kind of thing. I'll just mention that. Um, my first book that I wrote with Charlene Lee called Groundswell 10 years ago about social media, it was a very well-written book. It was a great idea, and it sold 150,000 copies. And I was like, oh, that's so awesome. I know how to write a best-selling book. Well, I knew how to write a good book, and I got lucky with the timing. And I've gotten up to bat a bunch of times since then uh, and helped other people with books that I thought were excellent. But hasn't happened at that level of success. Even though those other books have been helpful from a thought leadership perspective, you don't usually get the chance to just bat out a bestseller. So the average book is not going to sell 150,000 copies, not even close. No. If you're in a position to get uh, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 copies of a book out, you'll be moderately successful as an author, at least as far as the books go, but you could be incredibly successful in terms of generating business. 
And I often find that what matters is not how many go out there, but that that book gets in the hands of someone who says, ah, this is the person I need to talk to. This is the idea I need to know about. And that is really where the value is, is in reaching those people. They're exactly the right audience for you. All right. So the so the summary is you write for most of us, you write a business book because it will help you reach your target audience. Get your name out there and build your build your brand. Exactly right. And I want to focus on what you said about your target audience. So you need to have a very clear idea when you start of who that audience is. So your audience might if you're writing a book on artificial intelligence, your audience might be CIOs and their direct reports. If you're writing a book on on marketing, maybe it's CMOs and their direct reports. Uh, if you're writing a book on productivity, then um, your audience might be really anyone who wants to to be more productive at work. Uh, but that's a little bit of a different proposition. But unless you have a clear idea of who's going to benefit from the book, and I mean specifically salespeople, marketing people, whatever, unless you have that idea in your head then the book doesn't have the necessary focus to be successful. So that audience is the kind of crucial, once you decide on your motivation for writing the book, defining your audience is the next crucial step. Yes, it is. And I'd I'd go a little bit further than that. Um, You want to have a statement of how you are going to help people. All successful business books are about helping people. Um, If they're about strategy, they're about helping people to develop strategies for their business. If they are about productivity, they're about helping people to get more done during their day. Um, There are a few that are uh, memoir, and that's just entertainment. You know, how I started this company, this exciting thing happened. But in the end, those are just like fiction. People buy them for the narrative. 99% of the time, the question is, what's my target audience, and what will they learn that will be helpful to them from reading this. You know, I got a free copy of Neil Young's autobiography, and it was very entertaining. I don't think I learned anything, but it, but I enjoyed it. All right, how do we how do we identify the right audience? I think that ought to be simple. So, uh, if you are, the, first of all, there's no reason for you to write a book if you don't have an idea. So you need to have an original idea. Well, how did you get that original idea? Well, that comes from your work. If you're a consultant, maybe you talk to dozens of people who are all trying to scale up from medium to large size businesses. Uh, Maybe you're a company that offers um, uh, ratings and review software, so you're helping people to improve their websites and use ratings and reviews. Whatever, Whatever it happens to be in your business, you are presumably providing some sort of a product or service that's helping people. So your audience in general is the kind of people who you've been helping in your work. And your objective is to help them to understand what you've learned from interacting with so many people like that over the course of that work. So the audience then is the set of people that you have been selling to, working for, is that the summary? I'd go broader than that. The set of people that you have been uh, interacting with and influencing in some sense or another. So it might be that you sell to medium-sized businesses, but you've got a realization that you think helps small businesses and larger businesses as well. But unless these ideas that you've developed in the course of your work are applicable to that, that whole audience, then you really don't have enough of a focus to be able to say something useful. All right. So now you've identified that audience. What does that mean for the way you construct the book? Well, um, I'm going to actually reveal to your listeners here the complete code for how business books work. I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. Go, go, go. Okay. Uh, It's not a secret. Anyone who's read business books sort of knows this, but I keep getting authors who are like, oh, they don't understand how this works. So uh, the key thing to understand is about chapter one. And chapter one has one purpose. Chapter one of your book is to scare the crap out of your chapter. Um, Because you got to jolt people awake and make them say, oh my gosh. And there are two forms of scare the crap out of you. 
there's fear and there's greed. So fear is, oh my gosh, something bad could happen unless I do what this book says. So it might be, we need to change the way we safeguard our data or we're going to have a data breach. That would be an example of a fear book. Um, greed is much simpler. That's just, oh, there's a trend here. And if we jump on board this, we can be more productive. We can more su- be more successful. We can make more money. And these are not exclusive either. You can have fear and greed in the same book. But chapter one is to scare the crap out of you. And chapter one tends to have a bunch of unsupported assumptions in it because people are willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. It's like, oh my gosh, this sounds amazing. This is really different. I never thought about it this way. If this is true, then I have to do things differently. Well, that's what the rest of the book is about. Uh, The chapters that follow chapter one, uh, chapter two and chapter three and so on are going to be backing up your case. This is where the person says, if this is true, you're like, let me explain to you the proof about the fact that this actually is true. And then what follows that are the consequences. Here's what this means for middle managers, and here's what this means for senior managers. Here's what this means for pharmaceutical companies, and here's what it means for medical device companies, and here's what it means for doctors. Or there's five steps you need to follow, and here's step one, and then the next chapter is step two, and the next chapter is step three, and so on. So the the last two-thirds of the book, I guess you would say, is about the consequences and then what you need to do to actually take this insight and do something useful with it. Josh, you've been describing a story arc. And so maybe weave that concept in here for us. Okay. So uh, certainly there's an arc for the whole book, but I think actually more important is to look at the arc that goes on in an individual chapter, because those are the stories that get woven together into the whole book. Um, I was recently working with an author and I realized this person doesn't really understand how these ideas go together. Uh, and I realized, okay, I should write down how that works. So if you have a chapter in a business book, you want to think about an objective. So this is like the behavioral objectives that educators use. And the objective is something like, at the end of reading this chapter, the reader will be able to... So that might be, at the end of this chapter, the reader will be able to... Uh, recognize the four causes of disruption and uh, and understand how they apply to their business. Or at the end of this chapter, the reader will be able to change their strategy about how they use email and become more productive. Now, the reason I say you need that objective is because at the beginning of the chapter, you set up the problem. It's not a mystery. You say, I'm going to tell you how to do these things. And then you explain this thing comes next and this thing comes next and this thing comes next. And it's like, okay, now I see how to do the thing that this chapter was trying to teach me to do. Um, I should also talk about uh, case studies. I'm actually editing a book right now and my feedback is going to be, this is all theory. When do I see this actually in practice with companies? And it just makes so much difference in a book to tell stories. So, uh, I learned early in my career because I was an analyst, I wrote a book proposal and the uh, agent came back and said, this isn't a business book. There's no people and there's no stories. It's like, oh, that's really important. And what I realized is that all books, including business books, are made out of people and stories, which means you need to have case studies that start, you know, you know, Fred had a problem. His business was starting, uh, wasn't growing the way that it used to. And as a result, this happened. And then this happened. Then he had this realization and he did this. And these things happened. And they all lived happily ever after. And then at the end of that, you say, what can we learn from Fred's experience? Without those people and stories, it just becomes sort of dry and academic and uninteresting. So storytelling is a crucial aspect of this whole process. Yes, it is. And there are some books that are almost all case studies. Um, I mean, the ingredients of a business book are uh, the case studies, there's argumentation, there's proof points like statistics and surveys, for example, um, uh, and there's recommendations, right? You have to do these things as a result of what I've seen uh, or what I've explained. But 
the people and the stories are what make this come alive because the reader, as they are reading it, they say, oh, yeah, I see what she's going through. I feel the same way. If she solved her problem, maybe I can solve my problem in the same way. Okay. There's also the stories with the unhappy ending. Oh, look what happened to him. That was a disaster. I got to make sure that doesn't happen to me. What are the components of a good story? I think storytelling is so important and people have a lot of trouble with it. So what are the components of a good story? I just want to say that the best stories are from firsthand interviews or experience. So you can write, you know, in one of my books, I wrote the story about how uh, T-Mobile succeeded and I didn't get a chance to interview them and that was okay. But it's much better if you actually get to interview the people firsthand and write their story, whether they're some individual nobody's ever heard of or the uh, you know a product manager at Procter and Gamble. And uh, the the ingredients are uh, you'd get a quick introduction to the person. You know, Chandra had been a product manager for the last fifteen years, um, and in fact, she'd always wanted to do that since she was a child. Um, that's all you need to say about Chandra. We, we don't really want to know what color hair she has or or that you know her mother was a ballet dancer. Uh, and then you set up the problem. These are the problems that this this uh, person faced. You talk about the struggles that they had trying to solve those problems. There's usually some sort of a realization. And then very important is you need to have results, preferably quantitative results. They finally hit on this, and once they started doing this, sales increased by 27%, and they made $116 million more than they had the previous year. Okay, now I'm paying attention. The final part, which is typically not actually shown in the story, but comes right after it in the text, is what I call the moral of the story. And this is, what can we learn from Chandra's experience? And then you get into, uh, you know, connecting that to the lessons or structures or frameworks or or uh, advice that you have in your book. I actually had an editorial comment in one of the books I worked on recently. The guy thought it was so funny, he actually published it on his Facebook. Um, I said, this is a fascinating story. However, it actually proves exactly the opposite of what you're trying to say in this chapter. <laughs> so we realized, okay, there's a problem. It's a really interesting story. But it doesn't actually communicate that you are an expert and you have a knowledge and a different way to look at things. In fact, it's showing people that uh, the opposite of what you said is actually true. Can you explain to us the link between that initial focus you described at the beginning of our conversation on the importance of audience and the type of stories that you weave in so that we don't run into this kind of problem that you just described? I think it should be pretty clear that the people that you're telling the stories about should be similar to the people who are reading the book. And in some cases, that's aspirational. So uh, if I'm going to tell you a story about a product manager at at CVS, um, then if you're a product manager, you're going to be like, okay, well, I don't actually work at a retailer, but my problems are not all that different from uh, from his problems. So maybe I can uh, take some lessons from this. Um, and there, you know, people like to throw in stories about, you know, Shonda Rhimes or Michael Jackson or something, and that's fine, but you really don't need very many, uh, very much of that because most people don't identify with those folks. Uh, now it can be aspirational. So, uh, for example, in Groundswell, my, my, uh, first book was Charlene Lee. Um, we talked about people in all different roles in business and that, uh, booked ended up being relevant for people, not just at the C-level in corporations, but all the way down through the management ranks. But they were all basically saying, hey, boss of my boss, look what these people did. We should be doing that. So so it was relevant to them because it was relevant to the environment they worked in, even if they were not the CMO of uh, of some company. It sounds like, as as you described earlier, that writing a book in a way is like content marketing. And it sounds like the lessons you're describing of focus and being aware of the needs of the audience are actually not any different from concepts in marketing, such as personalization and being aware of the, of who you're selling to. 
That's very much the case, but the difference here is the stakes. So if you look at content marketing, you know, okay, so you write a blog post. All right, so that took you uh, an hour and a half. Maybe it goes through some reviews, but that's a relatively small amount of effort. Go up a level of effort. We're going to write a white paper. Okay, we're going to have to do a survey and do some analysis, maybe uh, hire a writer to do that. Okay, maybe we end up spending eight or ten thousand dollars worth of effort on that. But if that fails, it's not a disaster. If you do a book, you're going to be working on this for three, four, five months. And as a result of that, you really have to get it right. Uh, if you put that much effort in and then you don't write it properly, you don't launch it properly, you don't think carefully enough about the audience, you don't use the right publishing model. There are all these things you can do wrong that will cause it to fizzle. And then at the end of that, it's like, wow, that was a lot of work and it didn't really do much good. Okay. And on the subject of blogs, we have a question from Arsalan Khan on Twitter, who asks, what are your thoughts about building a book audience in a blog? For example, writing chapters and subchapters in the form of blog posts, and should media be added to it? I think so. I think what he's asking is, can you take your blog posts and turn them into a book? Uh, I did. This is uh, my most recent uh, uh, book that came out under my own name, "Writing Without Bullshit." And uh, the way I wrote this is, I started a blog about writing. Um, I covered as many topics as I could about passive voice, about what it's like to do editing in a, uh, in a company, all of the different things. And then when I looked at all of those pieces, I was able to organize that together and say, you know what, there's about two thirds of a book here. Um, I'm definitely in favor of both building an audience and trying out ideas by blogging. Now, there is a philosophy that says that if you've already put the ideas out by blogging, then people won't want to read the book. But it's difficult for people to assemble all of the different ideas in your blog into a coherent whole. And uh, frankly, the person who is a big fan of your blog is much more likely to tell other people they ought to get the book than to be complaining that, oh, it's the stuff we already read. Um, so the kind of people who tell you not to do that, they're called publishers and you shouldn't listen to them. That's a kind of an interesting, uh, interesting topic. So let's talk about publishers and let's talk about uh, how, how do you bring, you've, you've now got the book, how do you bring your book to market? Okay, so the first thing to understand is that you want to be thinking carefully about publishing models before you write the book. Uh, because it's a very big risk to go and write the whole thing and then at that point, be saying, hmm, I wonder what I can do to, to get this published. There's three basic publishing models that you can use, and how you act will be different depending on which of these you choose. Um, if you have the ability to generate a very big audience um, and sell 10 or 20,000 copies and you can prove it, then you might consider going through traditional publishing. And I've done a number of books through traditional publishers. That book I just showed you was uh, at Harper Business. Um, my first book was at Harvard Business Press. And uh, the good news about going that way is that people, you actually get paid to do it. You get an advance. Uh, the challenge is that you have to get selected. They have to actually believe you, which means you need to pitch them before the book is done with a proposal. And that's a fair amount of work. And uh, it is probably about 15 to 18 months between the time that you make the deal and when the book comes out. So most people are too impatient to really put up with that. And if you're not willing to wait a while, then you're going to have a problem with traditional publishing. This, the second model that's available now uh, is a hybrid publisher. And a hybrid publisher is just like a traditional publisher, except the hybrid publisher works for you. Um, so you basically hire a publisher to produce the book for you. Uh, I ghost wrote two books last year, and both of them are being done by a hybrid, hybrid publishing model. Here, I'll show you one of them. This is a book called uh, Marketing to the Entitled Consumer. Uh, you can see it, uh, it says Nick Worth and Dave Franklin with Josh Burnoff. So those are the two guys that I helped with this book. And we hired uh, Mascot Books to produce the book for us. So that goes much faster 
Um, and frankly, a, a hybrid publisher is much more responsive because you're paying them. Um, you're probably looking at more like uh, eight or nine months between when you make the deal and when the book comes out as opposed to 15 to 18 months. But uh, the challenge there is it's expensive. Um, so it might cost you 10, 20, even uh, 40 or $50,000 because you pay for everything, including printing the books. Um, the third model, which I've increasingly been involved in, is a self-publishing model. Um, and in the self-publishing model, you uh, produce the book and then you upload it to Kindle Direct Publishing, and it's available on Amazon as both an ebook and a print-on-demand book. So um, I edited two books that uh, fit that model uh, in the last uh, last year. This is an example of one of them. It's called uh, Data Leverage, and you can see the two authors are Christian Ward and James Ward. And it's a paperback book, but it looks pretty much like any other paperback book. It's a you know quality product. We did a nice cover on it. It's well edited. It went through copy editing. We paid somebody to do the cover. Um, and anyone can get a look at this. And it's much less expensive to produce a book this way. But such a book will not appear in the airport bookstore. It will not appear uh, in uh, any place except on Amazon. Uh, and uh, while it can be produced much more quickly, it has a lot less of an impact than a traditionally published hardback book. Um, so you, if you want speed, you go with self-publish. If uh, you don't mind the cost you uh, and you want to go moderately fast, you can go with a hybrid publisher. And if you want the prestige and you want to get paid, but you're willing to wait a while, you can go with tr traditional publishing model. Josh, you mentioned earlier that if you think you can sell, what was the number, 20,000 books, then you may be a candidate for traditional publishing? Right. There's one publisher I, I know. I'll mention their name. Uh, it's Wiley. Uh, and they, the guy there has just specifically told me, if you can sell, prove that you can sell 20,000 copies, we'll consider it. And if you can't, we won't. So they're not in the business of trying to take big risks. They really want you to show you're going to do all of the work. And that means you need to have speaking engagements or a sales force that's going to roll it out um, or a blog that reaches a million people or, or some other mechanism that proves to them that you can sell 20,000 copies. Um, the, the other publishers are, uh, some of them are, have a, are a little bit more willing to take a risk with you. But increasingly, in your book proposal, you need to say, these are the activities I'm going to use to promote the book and why I believe we can sell X number of copies. If you self-publish the book, do you, have the, do you gain the same benefit of credibility and the opportunity as sort of a, a, a key to open the doors to speaking engagements and other kinds of activities that you would, that you would have if you were going through a traditional publisher? It's harder. It's definitely harder to do that. Um, so uh, most of the uh, people who really want to have an impact are going to be going through either a traditional publisher or hybrid publishing. Um, but, you know, there's no free lunch here. Uh, you, you either have to pay or you're not going to have as big of an impact. But, I mean, if you look at the, the, the two books that I edited uh, last year that went through this model, um, one's called... Uh, clarity wins, and that's for small business people to be able to uh, to get referrals. And that book doesn't have to sell twenty or thirty or forty thousand copies to be successful. It just has to get into the hands of people who say, "Oh, I got to work with this guy," um, and then generate business for the person who wrote it. The same with the data leverage book I showed you. That just needs to get into the hands of the people who are making data strategy decisions in companies, they're going to read that and say, oh, man, I got to work with these guys. They're the experts. And it will generate that business for, for the authors of that book. We have another uh, question from Twitter. And Viraj Shah says, can you summarize the experience of writing a book in one written sentence? <laughs> <laughs> no, I cannot. And the reason I cannot summarize the experience of writing a book is that it is not the same for everybody. So if you ask me to summarize my experience of writing a book, I would say uh, come up with an incredible idea, do some fascinating research, interview people to get really interesting stories, and then weave it together using prose that makes 
people thrilled and excited. Um, and that's my definition of a good time. The fact that that's my job now, my gosh, that's I'm just so excited to be able to do that at this point in my life. Um, other people find the experience painful. It's like, I can't figure out what I want to say. Uh, I can't get the words to flow. I can't figure out what the structure is. I don't really know what my idea is. And that can be very frustrating. And to be frank, that's really what my business is about is to sit down with people like that and help them. But I, uh, in an, even in the cases where they've they've had that and that's come out and they're like, oh look here, I I produced it here it is. If you don't launch it properly, then the experience of writing a book is, wow, I put all of that stuff, all of my energy into that. I produced this really good thing, and then it went out into the ether and made no impact whatsoever. You know, as I, I I talk with many authors, it seems like a lot of my friends are and and professional colleagues are are authors. And the part that universally people seem to hate is the the editing and revision process. <laughs> That's you're making me feel like the dentist, right? It's like I know I need this, but I know it's going to hurt. It it doesn't have to be that way, and. Uh, in particular, when I function as an editor, I'm always very clear about what I believe the problems are and also why the writer is having these problems. And when you can connect what you need to do to how it will make the book more effective, it doesn't become so painful. Um, if you, the, the editing process is just basically somebody saying, oh, you're a bad writer, you're a bad writer, you're a bad writer, I'm so much so smart and you're so stupid, yes. That's going to be painful, but but a appropriate editing process, the editor is a partner with the writer, and at the end of it, the writer is saying, not only is the book better, but also uh, I feel like I know more. Um, I'll just mention this at, at Forrester Research. Part of my job was to edit um, the most important reports that, that people were working on, and I consistently heard two things. One is while I was doing it, they said, wow, you are really making me work much harder than I ever had to work on one of these reports before. And then when it was done, they would say, would you edit my next report? <laughs> so, so clearly there was an understanding that that was getting to a level where it was it was valuable to the people who uh, were having that editorial experience. What about the the time commitment? I'm sure there are many people who have the platform, have the, the experience and the ideas, but they just don't have time to write a book. So where, do, where about that? Well, that can be very hard. Um, the kind of people who write the best books are successful business people. And successful business people are not known for having a whole lot of time available. So people end up working on uh, nights and weekends sometimes or on airplanes. Um, and if you can do that and that's good for you, that's great. Um, other people have a really hard time uh, getting the, themselves into the right frame of mind to do that, and that's where, in some cases, ghostwriting comes in. So the uh, the book I showed before, the marketing book, um, those two guys really wanted to write it themselves, and then after a while, they came back to me and said, you know, we just can't get the time together to do this. And if you read that book, it is their ideas expressed in the words that would have been the words that they used. They just hired somebody else. In this case, it was me as their ghostwriter to assemble it and put it together. And uh, it was a lot easier for them to read what I wrote and said, right, here's what you got right. Here's what you got wrong. Here are the changes you need to make than it would have been to actually sit down and write paragraph after paragraph of prose, given how busy they were. I want to shift in a moment to the marketing of the books. However, there I do have a burning question that I've wondered about uh, folks like yourself who write books for others. How do you keep your ego in check that you're doing all of this work and it's not your name at the end of the day at the, on the top of the door, so to speak. It's somebody else's name. Um, there's a pretty easy answer to that question. I get paid. <laughs> so so um, I just wrote a book for a uh, CEO in Silicon Valley about artificial intelligence. I, I ghost wrote that, that book for him. And my name is on the cover, but it's, it's below his name. And that's as it should be because it's his ideas and his concept. Um, 
And it was an exciting project to work on. I'm really pleased with how it came out. But when there was a disagreement, he always won because it was his book. Um, and uh, having ghostwritten those two books last year, um, I'm ready to do one on my own. But uh, this is, I'm, I'm, you know, this is, this is, it's just a different, different kind of, of project. When you are an editor, when you're a ghostwriter, uh, or when you're doing idea, idea development with an author, and those are three of the things that I do, it's really not about me. I'm in a service position. And it's just like anyone else who's in a service position. Your job is to serve the needs of your client. Um, and uh, it, it, it's really not about you know getting your name on the door. That's, that's appropriate when you write your own book. It's not appropriate for these other things. You know, it's funny. I I interview a lot of people, obviously, for CXO Talk and moderate panels. Very much the, exactly the same kind of thing. Uh, and when you're interviewing somebody, I'm sure it's when you're the same when you're editing or writing for them. Your job is to bring out their best. I very much feel that way. My definition of success is that when someone looks at what I've helped them to create, whether I'm ghostwriting for them or whether I'm editing them, that they look at it at, it at the end and say, you helped me to say what I really needed to say. You allowed me to, to get my voice. And I'm not trying to say what, what I believe. I'm trying to help them to say what they believe. And that's the definition of success in those, in those kind of relationships. All right. We have under 10 minutes, and there's one remaining topic that we absolutely need to talk about. And that is you've now got this book You've either gone to a traditional publisher who now expects you to be the one to sell the book and market the book, unlike the old days where that was kind of their job, uh, no longer, or you've published the book yourself and if you don't sell it, ain't nobody going to sell it at all. So selling the book is really darn important. How do, we, how do you sell your book? This is If you're going to uh, pitch a traditional publisher, you actually have to include a section in the proposal about how you're going to do this. And I find that that's valuable for people specifically because it forces them to think through the steps. And there are many elements of that, and it, it is different based on what your assets are. So among the elements are uh, your ability to, to give speeches. If you're in a position to give the keynote at a conference, that certainly will make a difference. Um, there's uh, increasingly large amounts of uh, bylined article activities, uh, opportunities. So you write a, an article for CRM magazine or you write an article for uh, training magazine or whatever the, the outlet is, and uh, they have space to fill and they're happy to do that. Um, I've written a number of, of uh, articles for uh, Harvard Business Review online, which is, has, gets the, a pretty significant audience. Some people have the ability to write op-eds, for example. Um, there's social media, um, so you certainly have the chance to talk about it and share shareable things, infographics, uh, you know, videos, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it's also there are also uh, more traditional content distribution, so blogging. So I my I blog every day at uh, at withoutbullshit.com uh, every weekday. So I've built up an audience there, and that gives me the chance to, to get the word out. Um, if it were your book, Michael, and uh, CXO Talk would be your chance to get the word out. So if you have a regular communication with the audience, you can, you can do those things. It's also possible to hire a book publicist, and the publicists basically understand how to do the things that I've talked about, only much more professionally. So they'll reach out to... Uh, you know, 150 influencers uh, about this. They'll reach out to a whole bunch of podcasts to try and get featured on them. Uh, they'll be able to identify more uh, byline articles and traditional press articles, chances for you to get quoted in the press, uh, put out a press release because your idea is relevant to something that just happened in the news. Whoever wrote the book about national emergencies is, is going to be a very popular guy in the next couple of days. So, uh, and of course, you have to pay the publicist. But uh, if you want to ramp things up to the next level, that's a, that's a great way to do that. I will say that here on CXO Talk, we get pitched folks who are writing, who have written books. I mean, we got pitched, for example, the chairman of Nokia. 
was a guest on this show because he wrote a book and it was a pretty, pretty interesting book. And uh, I'll give a shout out to an agency, a literary, I don't know if they're be called a literary agency. They're, I don't know if they're publicists, but they do book PR, but at a very high level. And that's Fortier, F-O-R-T-I-E-R. And they're excellent. If you look at that, they do that. Uh, Cave Henricks is the one I'm working with now. Stern and Associates is another one that that works with people who do a lot of public speaking. Um, and yeah, no, they're they're uh, top end people who can help you out. Okay, we have just a a couple of minutes left. Any final thoughts on this topic, Josh? That you think it's important to share that we haven't covered? Well, I guess what I'd leave people with is this question of, you know, people start with. I think I might want to write a book or people tell me I should write a book unless you have an idea that can actually change people's thinking and help them to do better in some way, then don't do this because you're talking about months and months of work. But if you do have that idea, if you really have this burning need to let people know that the world is different from the way they think it is. uh, And if you're willing to put in the time and effort, it can be a very rewarding thing. Uh, So I guess what I'd say is people really need to sort of take a step back and assess why are they doing this? Uh, And to the extent that they can justify that because they really have this powerful idea, it can be a very powerful thing uh, to do to reach your audience. Okay. Uh, Well, Josh Burnoff, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been a very interesting conversation. Michael, thanks thanks for having me on. And I uh, I guess the last thing I'll mention is if people want to get a look at what a book proposal looks like, if you go to the goodies uh, area on my website, withoutbullshit.com, and go to the bottom, you can actually click on and download a copy of the book proposal I wrote for Writing Without Bullshit and get a look at what's actually involved in that. Okay. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, please now subscribe on YouTube and go to the CXO Talk website and also sign up for our newsletter. We have amazing, amazing interviews there and come back and we'll see you again next time. Okay, everybody, have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.